Let's all find our seats, and uh, we'll stand up for a word of prayer, and we'll have a wonderful time of worship, I think. <laughs> Lord, we thank you for just being here with us tonight. May your spirit just really minister to us tonight, and may we just um, have a renewed joy in you, and may your spirit just um, fall afresh on us. And just bless your word tonight, too. And oh, I just thank you, God. In Jesus' name, amen.
can be seated if you like. like these I sing out a song I sing out a love song to Jesus in moments like these I lift up my hands I lift up my hands to 
In his time, in his time, in his time, in his time, Lord, he makes all things beautiful. In his time, Lord, please show. to you a lovely 
you make all things beautiful and we just we thank you that you have such mercy on us you make us beautiful we just love you we just want to return the love that you you gave so greatly to us and God we just want to lift your name up today tonight and bless your word tonight in Jesus name And Father, we um, thank you, Lord. You do make all things beautiful in your time. And, um, and our times are in your hands, Lord. Thank you, and we just praise you and uh, worship you, Lord, and ask that you bless your word uh, to our hearts again as we look in, and, and that you just teach us tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. So Zechariah chapter 2 next to the last book of the Old Testament. So we're almost done with the Old Testament. And uh, this is uh, chapter 2. We're calling this the measuring line. Now, remember, we're in a series of eight visions by uh, Zechariah. He gets all eight of these visions in one night, and it's in chapters 1 through 6. And last time we looked at the first two visions, the horsemen and the horns. And Zechariah's visions uh, are very apocalyptic, so the visions were not only for back then, but the scope of them went way beyond that into our future, still yet uh, future as Jesus returns as the coming king. And, and so a lot of what we're going to see in Zechariah is going to remind us of the book of Revelation. And we're going to move slowly through these visions so as not to overwhelm ourselves. <laughs> but keep in mind as we go through them that the language can only mean that the fulfillment of these visions is still yet future. And so in other words, the exiles coming back from Babylon are only the first stage of the fulfillment of these prophecies. There's a near fulfillment and a far fulfillment. And so uh, the rest of it zooms ahead into yet our future. And so we're looking at the third vision now, the measuring line in Zechariah chapter 2. So verse 1, Then I raised my eyes and looked, and behold, a man with a measuring line in his hand. So I said, Where are you going? And he said to me, To measure Jerusalem to see what is its width and what is its length. And so when you find God using a measuring line or an angel using a measuring line, it means that God's getting ready to move on behalf of whatever he's measuring, basically. And so here is a man doing this measuring. He's probably an angel. Some people see him still as the angel of the Lord that we saw in chapter 1. And he's measuring Jerusalem, showing that God was bringing back the exiles from Babylon to Jerusalem, but we're going to see, again, that the language goes way beyond that as we move into the chapter, because there was only, remember, a few people that actually came back from Babylon, about 50,000 uh, people in all, so this goes way beyond Zechariah's day into the future uh, when Jerusalem can't even contain the people in it. That's the language that we're going to see. And so this should also remind us, though, of the book of Revelation. Just as the horsemen in chapter 1, remember, reminded us of the four horsemen of Revelation, uh, here the measuring uh, line 
also reminds us of Revelation. For example, Revelation 11. Then I, John is speaking here, was given a reed like a measuring rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God, the altar, and those who worship there. But leave out the court, which is outside the temple, and do not measure it, for it's been given to the Gentiles, and they will tread the holy city underfoot for 42 months. So John is instructed to measure the temple, but leave the court out of that measurement. And we talked about why that uh, uh, probably was when we studied the book of Revelation. I'm not going to get back into that. You can get the (laughs) DVD or CD from that one. And then later in Revelation, speaking of the New Jerusalem, in Revelation 21, 16, it says the city is laid out as a square. Its length is as great as its breadth. And he measured the city with the reed, 12,000 furlongs, its length, breadth, and height are equal. And so this uh, is uh, after the millennium, there is going to be a new heaven, a new earth, a new Jerusalem that's going to have a very odd shape. And it's going to be basically a flying cube as it appears to be hovering over the earth. And incredible... uh, thing when we studied it in the book of Revelation, if you remember. Uh, The New Jerusalem will be 1,500 miles in length, in breadth, and in height. And this is going to be a huge city, uh, much larger than any city on earth today, for sure. And it's going to be the size of two-thirds of the United States, but in every direction. And if we put it over the Middle East, it would take up about that much room. And so a huge, huge uh, cubular, cubular, is that a word? Cubular city. And so this is, uh, this is it to scale, actually, and what it would look like to scale. And God's glory is going to light it up. No sun needed, no moon needed. The glory of God is going to light it up, and God himself will dwell with his people. And so Zechariah, these visions encompass all of this. Jerusalem and the temple in his day being rebuilt, that was only the first stage. This is looking forward to the ultimate fulfillment of the new Jerusalem. And you can see this in the language, like, for example, verse 3. And there was the angel who talked with me going out. And another angel was coming out to meet him, who said to him, Run, speak to this young man, saying, Jerusalem shall be inhabited as towns without walls because of the multitude of men and livestock in it. So speaking of a future day from Zechariah's day when Jerusalem would expand beyond its walls, there'd be so many multitudes of uh, people there. It just expands beyond its walls. And nothing like that has ever happened in history until today. And what we're seeing going on today. And that's going to continue to escalate uh, right to uh, the millennium. Of course, there's going to be some uh, dramatic things happen during the tribulation. So this goes into the future, into the millennial Jerusalem. And interesting, even during the time of uh, Jesus, Jerusalem was a walled city. Now, today, Jerusalem is a city without walls. It expands way beyond the old uh, walls. There's no wall to protect it anymore uh, because it extends beyond that. Of course, there's an invisible military wall, (laughs) you know, that the military has. uh, But it's no longer a city that has literal walls. So according to this, Jerusalem would one day extend far beyond the walls that it had back then. Jerusalem's most explosive growth has been in the last two centuries. In 1800, there was 9,000 people that lived there. In 1905, 60,000 people. In 1946, 164,000 people. And in 1967, 267,000 people. And in 1967, when the Jews gained control of the city of Jerusalem, it was 4.3 square miles. Today, in 2019, it's 48 square miles with 936,000 people. Almost a million people in uh, Jerusalem 
today. And so Jerusalem shall be inhabited as towns without walls because of the multitude of men and livestock in it. So we're seeing that happening, but it's going to be thinned out during the tribulation. But then in the millennium, whoo, man, it's going to take off. Clearly a a future prophecy from Zechariah's day. Uh, Verse 5, for I, says the Lord, will be a wall of fire all around her, and I will be the glory in her midst. So here's God. Obviously, this is a future day. God is going to be a wall of fire around them, and he's going to be the glory in her midst. And the word glory there is the Hebrew word kabod, and it's the normal word for glory, but what it means is heavy. Weight. It's it's the heaviness of the Lord, the weight of the Lord, of his self-manifestation. You know, back in the 70s and 80s, if uh, something was really deep, we used to say, man, that's really heavy, (laughs) right? (laughs) That's really heavy. Well, God is heavy, folks. That's his glory. God is weighty. He's deep. And so the glory of God would be in her midst. And that didn't happen in Zechariah's day. Remember, the glory of God, the Shekinah, Shekinah glory, had departed in Ezekiel's day. And it moved out of the temple, then it moved over the eastern gate, then it moved out to the Mount of Olives, and then it lifted and left. Not until the Lord returns at his second coming will his glory come back, according to Ezekiel 43. And in that day, the name of the city will be Yahweh Shema, which means the Lord is there. I think that's pretty neat. The Lord is there. Unger says in his commentary, the purpose of this third night vision in the series of eight is to set forth prophetically the restoration of Jerusalem with reference to Zechariah's time, but also in larger scope, to describe the yet future fulfillment in the kingdom age when the city will become the capital of the millennial earth. Particularly emphasized is the great increase in size, population, wealth, spirituality, and security of the city. You know, the world doesn't realize it, but Jerusalem is going to be the capital of the earth during the millennium. For a thousand years. Can you imagine trying to tell the Arabs that Jerusalem is going to be the capital of the earth with the Jews reigning from there as well? Wow. Klein writes this. The scope of God's promises does not adequately, adequately correspond to any historical epoch. The massive repopulation of Jerusalem, the Lord as a wall of fire around Zion, the Lord's glorious reign from within his holy city, and the many nations who will be joined with the Lord in that day, all prefigure an eschatological fulfillment, an end time fulfillment. So looking to the future, verse 6. Up, up, and that's the Hebrew word hoy or oi. It means woe, woe, woe. I'm not sure why they translated it up here. It's they're they're translating. They're trying to say that God is saying, "Get up and come out of Babylon," but it's really it's woe, woe. Flee from the land of the north, says the Lord, for I have spread you abroad like the four winds of heaven, says the Lord. Woe, Zion, escape you who dwell with the daughter of Babylon. So flee from the land of the north. And back then, the land of the north was Babylon. That's what it was considered. And it even says there, you who dwell in the daughter of Babylon. So this is to those who are still there in Babylon. Remember, only 50,000 came back. They're still there in Babylon, and they want to stay there. They don't want to come back. They had lost their faith in God. Their feeling, they felt like uh, he had turned the, his back on them. And now they're more comfortable in Babylon. All they see, see in Jerusalem is a city in ruins that needed to be rebuilt. And that would require a lot of blood, sweat, and tears. And that's why God exhorted them in chapter 1 to return to me. 
He said, return to me and here to flee from the land of the north. But in the end, only a small minority actually come back. They actually stay over there in Babylon. But the scope goes way beyond that. It says they're scattered to the four winds of heaven. And it's true that back then, some of them fled to Moab and some fled to Ammon and some to Edom. Even Jeremiah fled to Egypt, if you remember. Uh, but in its fullest fulfillment, that really happened after 70 AD when the Romans destroyed Jerusalem and the Jews were scattered throughout the earth all the way up until 1948 when Israel became a recognized state again and they started gathering back into the land. It, it, it amazes me how many uh, Jews have come from all over the world back into the land, back to uh, Jerusalem from the Soviet Union and from different parts uh, you know, of the world, Russia today. But practically for us, Babylon represents the world and the things of the world. And that's what God is saying. He's saying, come out of it. Come out of the materialism of this world. And God is encouraging them to return to him. But returning to him meant a lot of hard work and a lot of heartache. It meant rebuilding and having faith in the Lord, which is exactly what it means for us, folks, uh, when we turn away from the world and turn to him in faith. It's not easy being a Christian, amen? It is not easy being a Christian in this Babylonian world that we live in. It's materialistic, and it's hard, and there's a lot of heartache as well. So, that reminds us of the book of Revelation. In chapter 18, where it says, After these things I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was illuminated with his glory, and he cried mighty with a loud voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become a dwelling place of demons, a prison for every foul spirit, and a cage for every unclean and hated bird. For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. And the merchants of the earth have become rich through the abundance of her luxury. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins and lest you receive of her plagues. And so here's an exhortation to come out of the materialistic Babylonian world and follow the Lord. Verse 8, back in Zechariah 2. For thus says the Lord of hosts, He sent me after glory to the nations which plunder you. For he who touches you touches the apple of his eye. And the phrase there, he sent me after glory, is a tough one. We don't really know what that means. Uh, we're not really sure. There's a lot of different theories about it. But notice that the New King James Version has me in capital letters. It's capitalized. So God is sending the Messiah. God is sending Jesus after glory to the nations. It would appear in judgment. To judge them for how they treated the Jews because the Jews are the apple of his eye. And that's a phrase that God uses for the Jews several times and for his people in general in the Bible. However, this is not the usual Hebrew word for apple here. Zechariah uses the word baba, which only occurs here in the Hebrew Bible. And baba appears to be connected with the word Babylon. It means gate. Remember, Babel means gate to God or gateway to God. So it could be that Zechariah is saying that the Jews are the gate of God's eye, which would have been a pun against Babylon. Are you following that? Kind of a sarcasm against Babylon. You say you're the gate of God, but the Jews are the gate of my eye, if you will. 
And do you know, folks, that if you're a Christian, this applies to you as well? I mean, we are, you are the apple of God's eye. That's how he sees you. We always think that God must love other people more than us, but it's not true. God loves you as the apple of his eye. This is something I struggled with earlier on in my Christianity. You know, I was on fire for the Lord. I loved the Lord. I was, I was on, you know, I, I had a, uh, an amazing passion for the word of God and I could teach the word of God and I taught that God loved people, but I didn't believe that he loved me. I, I was falling short of that part of it, you know, and God had to touch my heart. Matter of fact, I just wrote a song about that. And uh, so, uh, um, but, uh, you know, God had to touch my heart to get me to realize that, wow, God loves me. I'm the apple of his eye as well. And he protects and he guards and watches over us. For example, Psalm 17. Keep me as the apple of your eye. Hide me under the shadow of your wings from the wicked who oppress me, from my deadly enemies who surround me. And Deuteronomy 32, 9. For the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is the place of his inheritance. He found him in a desert land and in the wasteland, a howling wilderness. He encircled him, he instructed him, and he kept him as the apple of his eye. It's beautiful, really. Verse 9. For surely I will shake my hand, literally I will wave my hand, against them, and they shall become spoil for their servants. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me. Again, me in capital, a capital M there. That's Jesus speaking. So God is saying anyone who messes with Israel will have God messing with them. Because they are the apple of his eye. And all God has to do is wave his hand. And the enemies of Israel become the spoils of Israel. Verse 10. Sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion. For behold, I am coming and I will dwell in your midst, says the Lord. So not only speaking of the future, when God will dwell in the midst, but this is something that Christians already have. He has sent the Holy Spirit to dwell in us. If you're a Christian, you have the Holy Spirit living in you. So God is dwelling in our midst, so sing and rejoice. Uh, I mean, do we rejoice about that? Do we rejoice that we actually have God dwelling in us through his spirit? I believe he wants us singing and rejoicing because he's among us. Verse 11, many nations shall be joined to the Lord in that day. That's a phrase that's speaking of the day of the Lord. In that day. And they shall become my people, and I will dwell in your midst. And then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. Obviously, this is speaking of the future. So the nations themselves will also one day become a part of God's people. In that day, the day of the Lord. And the day of the Lord... Uh, is uh, a time period, it's not a singular day, but it's a time period that includes the coming judgment and the tribulation period, the return of Jesus Christ at the end of that seven-year tribulation period, and then the messianic kingdom or the thousand-year reign, which is the blessing part of the day of the Lord. So looking at the verse again, in that day, I will dwell in your midst. So this is Jesus speaking here, saying that he's coming again. He's going to dwell among them, and the nations will join as the people of God as well. Clearly, future, right? That hasn't happened yet, folks. And notice the word dwell there. In the Hebrew, it's shakan. And it's where the word Shekinah comes from, or Shekinah. 
Shekinah. And so uh, remember the Shekinah, it was that visible presence of God dwelling among the people, a fire by night to keep them warm, a cloud by day to keep them cool in the wilderness. And in the millennium, Jesus is going to set up his reign and dwell in Jerusalem for a thousand years. Jerusalem is going to become the capital of the world with Jesus dwelling right there. Wow. Reigning with an iron scepter. And, you know, we often think, well, that must have been so cool. Right? I mean, men have the visible presence of God among them. But again, folks, if we are Christians... We have the Holy Spirit in us, which is far better. Let's remind ourselves of that. I think it's important. Acts 1 verse 8. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. 1 Corinthians 6 verse 19. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? Who is where? In you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own. For you were bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. And Romans 8, verse 9. But you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells where? In you. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. Ephesians 1.13 In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in which also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. John fourteen sixteen, And I will pray, the Father, Jesus says, and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever. The Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells, dwells with you and will be in you. And 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 1, verse 21. Now he who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us in, is God, who also has sealed us and given us the Spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. So the Holy Spirit dwells in in us, we do have that Shekinah glory, but it's in us, you see. Uh, Billy Graham wrote this. He said, the Holy Spirit produces the fruit of the Spirit, which is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There are people whom you may not be able to love easily, but the Holy Spirit will give you the power to love them. Love is the greatest evidence that you know Christ. The Holy Spirit can love through you. Do you know Christ, he says? The Holy Spirit comes to magnify, to glorify, and to exalt the Son. Jesus said the Holy Spirit shall not speak of himself. He comes to magnify the Lord Jesus Christ. He comes to glorify Jesus Christ. And the Holy Spirit is pleased when you glorify Christ in your life. Verse 12, and the Lord will take possession of Judah as his inheritance in the Holy Land and will again choose Jerusalem. This is the only time in the Bible that we have the phrase, the Holy Land. We call it today the Holy Land, don't we? But it's only mentioned that way in the Bible once and if you look at it today, it's anything but holy. But one day, it will be holy because God will dwell there himself. But it also shows us that that little piece of land over there is special to God. And it means something. You might say it's the center of the earth. I mean, for Ju Jerusalem to one day become the capital of the world, that's going to be the center, folks. 
And so verse 13, last verse, be silent all flesh before the Lord, for he is aroused from his holy habitation. In judgment, right? There was a bumper sticker years ago. I don't know if you, any of you saw it or remember it. It said, beware of lamb. Do you remember that? Beware of lamb, speaking of when Jesus comes in judgment to this earth. Be silent, all flesh, before the Lord, for he is aroused from his holy habitation. This world doesn't know what it's in for. Beware of lamb. When Jesus opens the seven seal scroll, as we studied in the book of Revelation, he's going to be aroused from his holy habitation. And we as Christians need to never lose sight of that because we have the answer. We have salvation. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word tonight, Lord, and for these visions. And as we move them slowly, Lord, I I just pray that we would meditate on them and apply them to our own lives. And that we would get everything that you want us to get out of them. I think Zechariah is a very important book. And so, Lord, just uh, continue to be with us as we study this and give us insight. Um, Open our minds and our hearts to, to what you would have to say to us through this book. And I, I thank you for this time in the middle of the week to to just come out and step into your presence, be with you and worship you and fellowship with each other and study your word. Lord, we need this. We need this uh, booster shot. And I thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand and just to really worship the Lord. of
isn't he? Isn't he? Isn't he? Isn't he?